Okie dokie, drawbacks of being an entrepreneur. Well, uh, they're pretty straightforward. Click, here we go. I'm just gonna go ahead and show all of them as opposed to waiting to go through them. Yep, back to this now. All right, so this is a pretty good list. Um, some of them are kind of related, but certainly among the biggest drawbacks of being an entrepreneur is the uncertainty of income and the risk of losing your entire investment. I have often jokingly responded uh, when somebody asked me what the definition of an entrepreneur is to say, oh, it's being self-unemployed for big chunks of your life. And that's really very true. You know, now that doesn't mean you don't necessarily have any income, but what that does mean is you don't necessarily know where your money's coming from and when it's coming in. So um, uncertainty of income is a big deal. Uh, if you can't deal with an, an uh, inconsistent cash flow for your personal life, then being an entrepreneur may not be the best choice for you. Uh, now, the number of entrepreneurs that never experience cash flow issues is pretty close to zero. Uh, most of them experience times when they are very, very stressed financially. This next one, risk of losing your entire investment. I want you to imagine something. Imagine that you've finished school. You've gotten a great job. You've, uh, I mean, a really great job. A, a job so good that not only can you get married and have kids, but 10 years from now, you're married, you have kids, and you have $50,000 saved up. And either you or your spouse have got a great idea for a business. I mean, it's a really great idea. And so you decide, you talk to your spouse, and you decide that it's okay for you to go ahead and take, say, $35,000 of your $50,000 Take 35000 and put it in a business. Now, that leaves you $15,000 in case something happens, you know, some sort of emergency. And with families and kids and all that kind of stuff, that's a realistic possibility. You know, medical stuff comes up, right? So you've taken $35,000 of your hard-earned, hard-saved money, and you put it into a business. They fail. Sometimes yours could. So you're rocking along. You've been in business now for seven, eight months, maybe 12 months. And things have gotten, they just haven't turned out like you'd like them to. And you're continuing to plug away because you don't want to have to have that tough conversation. That day when you decide that this just isn't working out. And so you have to go home and tell your spouse, darling, we just lost $35,000. That's no fun. That conversation is going to be one of the toughest conversations you ever have. And so because of that, you've got to be really comfortable with the fact that um, it's okay if that happens. I'm not saying it's okay to lose money. I'm not saying it's okay to fail. I'm saying that sometimes, even if you don't want it to happen, it happens. And so that's a tough conversation because you know, why did it fail? Was it you didn't try hard enough? You didn't work hard enough? Your idea wasn't good enough? I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why it doesn't. But nobody wants to have that conversation, especially when you've taken your family's hard-earned money and put it into a business and it's failed. So the risk of losing your entire investment leads to long hours of hard work. So here's the deal and lower quality of life. Think about this. So you've got a couple of kids and one of them's in soccer and one of them is in, I don't know, dance school. doesn't matter whatever they're in. The fact is you got a couple of kids that are doing stuff and they have stuff going on on Friday afternoon. They have stuff going on on Friday evening. They have stuff going on on Saturday morning and in fact all day Saturday. But you have a choice and your choice is either to work your tail off and work Friday night and work Saturday and work Saturday afternoon and miss all that stuff with your kids, um, or maybe disappoint a client and develop a bad reputation and get less than a stellar review, what are you gonna do? Well, you because you because you don't wanna lose your entire investment, you actually work incredibly long hours and your, your quality of life goes down and your stress levels go up because you have complete responsibility. There's literally no safety net. There's nobody to bail you out if things don't go well. 
And because of that, you can become very discouraged and depressed uh, and life can look pretty bleak. That's a realistic view of the downside of being an entrepreneur. Hey, um, Javier, do you have a question? If you do, speak up, sir. All right, I'm lowering your hand. Um, maybe you just put it up earlier. Okay, so these are real drawbacks. And another aspect of this is a lot of entrepreneurs, they don't really do a good job of developing a professional network of people that can support them. A lot of entrepreneurs don't, don't have somebody they can call up when tough, times are tough and talk with and, and brainstorm with because you, here's what happens. You come out of the corporate world and in the corporate world, you've got a person in the cubicle next to you. You've got a person on this side next to you. You've got a manager in the uh, office with the door on it, the glass door on it um, or the glass wall uh, right next to you. And there's another one next to him or her and, and you've got people around you that are experienced, that you can have a little chat with, that can help you solve your problems. But as an entrepreneur, uh, especially a solo entrepreneur, solopreneur type of entrepreneur, somebody with a really small business, you're the top of the pyramid when it comes to knowledge and decision making. And therefore, it's really important for you to develop a great network of other business people that you make time to network with because if you don't then it becomes even more difficult to solve the problems that you are expected to have the answer to and often don't that's part of the ambiguity thing that we talked about um, early on in flexibility so there is a real downside to being an entrepreneur all of this stuff is very powerfully negative stuff um, this is a slide that talks about the percentage of companies businesses every year that are a startup business. And it's a simple definition of startup. If a business is in its first year, uh, this is um, the percentage of businesses in the United States that are within their first year. And you can see that back in 1977, a little over 16% of all businesses were less than one year old. Now, uh, well, not now, but the most recent data, 2013, has that number at eh, probably just a little over 8%, maybe between 8 and 9%. So what that means is the number of companies that are what you would consider startups um, has been diminishing over time. Now, in all fairness, while this may indicate a gradual decline in the number of startups, you have to also realize that in that same time frame, the population of the United States has grown from somewhere in the 260, 240 million range to 360 or 70 million people. The United States has become significantly larger. So if you have a steady state of 500,000 businesses every year forming, every year there's 500,000 businesses that are within their first year. As the total number of businesses increase because the United States is getting larger, as the total number of businesses increase, even though there's always 50,000, the percentage will, of course, decline. But what this just says is that startups are declining as a percentage of the total businesses in the United States. It's an interesting statistic. So I have a, I have a question on that graph. Yeah. So um, I think the graph is, if you look at it, I think it's kind of um, the it's kind of an unfair representation in the later half because this has just the first, this was, you know, we had the recession in 2008 and this is five years after the recession and it's uh, seven and, you know, this graph is seven years old. So yeah, yeah. how has this changed since this graph, you know, that was kind of an odd case, I guess, showing it at the recession. Yeah, you know, um, and that's a great observation. And certainly is, I mean, I even went back and I overlaid um, different uh, administrations, starting with Carter and Bush and, you know, Reagan and all that kind of stuff, trying to consider what has put in and whatever administrations and policies changed. And um, it, it really doesn't have any really high degree of visible 
of the By the way, if, if you're, please check your mute to make sure that if there's background noise, you're muted. Yeah. So, but I could give it under all, but I need it. Can you give me back sometimes? I could give it back to you tomorrow. <laughs> Okay. Twenty-one. I'm not sure where it is. I don't know. Let's see here. Okay, okay. but because when you are small, mm. you guys are small. I go to houses. You know what I mean? Yeah, how do I? How do I do this? I stuff. You do. I'm by myself all the time. I know, but you. <laughs> what are you talking about? Before that. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. You went with me like twice. Okay. Listen. I got under the order. Private conversation. Okay. What you want? All right. So we are now going to have to move to a mode where you do raise your hand because I'm not going to hear you unmute yourself because somebody isn't capable of muting themselves. So I will watch for the hand. Okay, so um, Aiden, to your point, um, that is a, a fair uh, observation. And unfortunately, that's one of the problems with statistics is you can't, um, you know, you can't always get the ideal data that you'd like, which would be current data. So, um, you know, certainly there's probably an increase, but still the general trend has been down. There's no denying that the general trend is generally down. Um, even if there was a little bit of an uptick, it's still generally down. Uh, yes, um, Amir. Okay, I'm trying to get you to unmute. You're going to have to click your own unmute button. Go ahead. Well, in 1977, we did not have the technology that we have today. So since we have technology that has lessened a lot of labor work, so definitely the startups are going to go down because more work is done by technology than humans probably. That could be another reason why we see the decline. Well, and to take that argument and flip it around, because technology is so easy for an individual like you or me to create a business with nothing more than a laptop and a, an iPhone, the fact is it's never been easier to start a business than it is if you just have an idea. So the flip side of that is technology makes it so easy to start businesses. Why aren't there 10 times as many being started now as there were back then when it was so much more difficult? So that particular argument actually could go either way. Um, so it's, it's really hard to pin, uh, to pin the decline on one thing or another. Uh, that's a great observation, but you see how it could go either way. So anyway, the point is, um, there is a general decline, but it's only a percentage decline. It's not necessarily an absolute decline. And so, um, I, I don't know, that's, that's kind of that. Okay, so what feeds the uh, fire, if you will, of entrepreneurial activity? Well, there's a lot of things going on. First of all, um, our society has grown to recognize and give lots of accolades and celebrity status to those entrepreneurs that are extremely successful. And in fact, people that are entrepreneurs are generally looked upon positively because they take risks in the furtherance of or the pursuit of dreams and goals and, and they create jobs and all that kind of stuff. So there's a real positive orientation in our society towards entrepreneurs. Um, there's also a lot of entrepreneurial education going on that simply did not exist 20, 30 years ago. 30, 40 years ago, when I was an undergraduate um, and even going through graduate school, this course did not exist. There was literally no way for anybody that was in university that I'm aware of at that time to take a course on entrepreneurship. If they existed, they were extremely rare. I had to take classes on accounting and finance and management and marketing and all that kind of stuff to be able to get the baseline knowledge. Then I had to go out and work in the real world to be able to get some real world experience before I really started pulling the pieces together. Um, now with degree programs in entrepreneurship and courses in entrepreneurship, there certainly is a lot more uh, foundational knowledge and training that is available than there used to be. There are a lot of demographic and economic factors. Uh, people are much more aware of, especially in the age of the internet, much more aware of the ability to take an idea, do something with it, and then put it out on the internet, put it out 
in some way, shape, or form. I mean, there are people that make celebrity status and make good money off of nothing more than their ability to write interesting articles about foreign destinations or in exotic foods, even ordinary foods. I've seen articles about oatmeal that are actually quite intriguing. So the point that I'm making is, is if you have an interesting ability, an, an ability to do something, there's never been a greater opportunity for you in that sense. The shift to a service economy, it used to be that there was this general perception that if you're not manufacturing something, that somehow you don't really have a real business, that somehow the United States was um, in decline because so much of the um, business um, energy of our country had gradually shifted away from manufacturing to services. Well, I think you'll agree if you want, I've got an example for you that information is actually the most valuable thing on the planet. Um, I'll give you a super simple example. Just pretend for a minute like you're a rifleman on a Marine um, rifle squadron that's going to try to root out some terrorists in a building somewhere. And you don't know what's on the other side of that wall. Wouldn't you like to know whether or not there's somebody with a gun pointed at you and which way that gun is pointed before you bust through a door or go over that wall? Well, of course you would. That information, information, knowledge, is the most valuable thing that there is. They take that same concept into the world of business. Wouldn't you like to know what your competitors are about to do? Or wouldn't you like to know uh, what they've done as soon as they've done it? Well, information gives you the ability to take, take to, to design a competitive response and or to create a competitive strategy that allows you to uh, get the better of your competitors. So information is incredibly valuable. Now, that's not to say that manufacturing things isn't important, but you know, when you really look at the greatest value that exists, the greatest value exists in the um, intellectual property that is created by the human mind, which you guys are getting added value to it, uh, even as we speak. Then there's technology advancements. You know, this thing right here, I, I mentioned earlier that this simple device, whether it's made by Apple or Samsung or anybody else, has the ability to put your thoughts and your ideas in front of a couple of billion people. Now, you're probably not going to get in front of a couple of billion people, but the potential exists. And the only thing stopping you from promoting your thoughts and your ideas, your business, your products, to a couple of billion people is the creativity with which you attack that task. So if you have a creative mindset and have the ability to find a, a unique and powerful message, you can get that message to an incredible number of people. Independent lifestyle, the fact that we have the ability to live um, with a laptop and a cell phone and a Wi-Fi connection, you can live almost anywhere and make a living today. Very independent lifestyles. And of course, all that comes about is the internet and cloud computing. Um, this is uh, a, a slide that goes through 2020. I think 2020 is a projected number, but the rest of them are actual numbers showing that e-commerce sales continue to increase. Now, I know that the majority of you and majority of people in general think that it's impossible to launch an e-commerce business because Amazon has everything sewed up. But that's just simply not the case. There are tons of businesses that are finding creative ways, leveraging Amazon and competing with Amazon to find market niches where there is significant opportunity for them to create great lifestyle businesses and even great businesses where investors can invest and get a good return. So online retail sales are continuing to increase and still represent a small fraction of the total economy in the United States, even though it's growing as a percentage pretty rapidly. Um, another thing is international. I don't know how many of y'all are aware of how many different um, vehicles there are for you to get engaged or involved in, in uh, international activities, but there's tremendous opportunities. One of the most important and valuable um, companies on the internet is a company some of you have heard of. It's called uh, Automatica, but another is, um, I mean, it's Word, they basically own WordPress, but there's another company called Woo Themes that started out making WordPress themes and then migrated into making 
a, an e-commerce platform or technology that integrates with WordPress. Why am I mentioning them? I'm mentioning them because they actually are a global company. Global in the sense that there are independent um, members of that, comp that company, Woo Themes, that are located, I mean, I think the headquarters is in uh, South, uh, South Africa, whatever the name of the, can't think of the name of it, but it's on the southern tip of the South Africa, Cape Town. They're in Cape Town, but they have owners and, and members of their teams spread out around the globe. England, Germany, United States, um, China, Russia. I mean, they're, they're spread out all over the place. These are people that help develop and design Wu Themes, and that's a company worth well over a billion dollars because of the, what they've created just by connecting with each other and creating value. So there's tremendous international opportunities um, in, in all kinds of different ways. There is, it's never been easier to be um, a young entrepreneur. I got a call last night from a guy that graduated a year and actually last December, um, I met at UT Arlington that started a company where he is building a, um, uh, uh, it's a haptic glove. It's a glove that you put on your hand that you can wear in a, in a, um, a, a virtual gaming environment. And while you have an Oculus headset on, you can reach out, you can grab things, you can manipulate things, you can pull triggers. It's not just like a Wii handset. It's actually a glove that you can put on your hand and do things. I mean, this is a guy that's your age. Now he's an engineering graduate at UT Arlington, but this is a guy that's your age that's in the process of creating a, 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 a product that um, while there are um, some products out there that do some of these things, there's still, still such a new market that, um, you know, uh, he just had an idea and he's an engineer and he starts building it. Do you have to be an engineer to start creating a product or a service? Well, kind of depends upon the product or the service that you think of, but you know, it's, it can be done. That's the important thing. It can be done. Um, so this is a chart that shows the, um, the, the percentage of activity of entrepreneurship in different age groups. And, you know, it's, um, I just, it's an interesting slide that shows that there's lots of entrepreneurial activity across all age groups, but the age group that's the uh, most active would be the, um, this one right here, that's the 12 to 13%. And if I've got the color chart figured out correctly, that's the 25 to 35, 34, four, four year old age group. Um, so, uh, just some interesting points. Women, women have tons of, of opportunities. There's all kinds, I mean, women are minorities and, um, and minorities have, um, ex um, additional benefits, um, uh, you know, in terms of certain, um, funds and governmental programs that are available to them. But, uh, with, even without that, women are certainly an up and coming sort of class of entrepreneurs, uh, minority owned businesses, uh, aside from women, other minorities are uh, rapidly growing in their entrepreneurial sort of activity levels. Um, the Hispanic community represents, um, this is, these are businesses since um, percentage growth in the number of businesses owned since 2002. Um, so this is a slide deck that shows, shows the Hispanic community has 43.6% uh, growth in new businesses. The uh, African-American community has had 60.5% growth in new businesses. I mean, you're seeing a lot of growth among uh, many different minorities. In fact, I, I suspect the growth rate in new businesses there is exceeding the, you know, the white majority community. Um, here's a slightly different um, um, chart, sort of the same, same thing. This is the percentage of new entrepreneurs um, that um, exist in the, or basically there's two different charts here. There's a, a chart for two, 1996 and a chart for 2016. So there's 20 year difference. And uh, you can see that um, in the Hispanic community 20 years ago, or at the beginning of that 20 year time frame, about 10% of the population was involved in a um, entrepreneurial activity, whereas now it's about 24% of the population. That's a, that's a huge increase. Uh, the other communities have increases, but not as large as the population increase percentage for the um, 
uh, Hispanic community. Very interesting data point there. Immigrant entrepreneurs, immigrants um, continue to be uh, a significant source of new entrepreneurial activity uh, as they come into the United States. Uh, Part-time entrepreneurs, uh, people that have day jobs that create uh, a business. So when you read the frame destination case study, the interview as an example of, of kind of how you should do one, uh, you'll see that Mark Rogers, who started Frame Destination, was had a day job, and he started Frame Destination uh, in his evenings and weekends, and he actually kept his day job for about 18, almost 24 months before he left his day job and went to work full-time. Uh, now, he, he reached the point where he, he was working about 80 to 90 hours a week, 40 hours at his day job, and another 40 or 50, um, and he finally was just basically worn out. He had to, he had to quit something, so he he quit his day job and be, worked for his, his business. But that's a very common thing. You know, start a business while you're working somewhere else. That's very, uh, very common. Home-based businesses. Now, um, you know, home-based businesses are um, uh, something that you can do out of your house. I'm not talking about MLMs. I'm not talking about Mary Kay and that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm talking about a business that uh, you might do out of your house, like baking cupcakes or um, something else. I mean, you might be a a shade tree mechanic, a, a mobile mechanic can work out of your house. I mean, there's all kinds of things that you can do uh, where you can work out of your house. Family businesses. These are, of course, businesses that you either start with your family or uh, maybe you're the child of the, of the family that started the business, but, uh, you know, family-oriented businesses. Copreneurs, this is husband and wife teams. That can be particularly challenging, but, um, uh, you know, if you have the right relationship, that can be very rewarding. Corporate cast-offs, people that, um, you know, basically are shown the gate because there's a downsizing or something like that. You see a lot of that going on right now with companies like American Airlines and other big corporations that are laying off people. Or, well, they're actually encouraging people to take early retirement or they're just plain saying, hey, we can't, we don't, we can't use you anymore. And so they usually give them a severance package. And that may not be big. In some cases, it's big. But corporate cast-offs are a very um, strong source of uh, franchisees. Corporate cast-offs tend to be people that like the structure of a corporation. They're given a severance package and some chunk of money. Said so take off. And um, so they go find a franchise that they can start with the amount of money that they've got. And they, they start franchises. Corporate dropouts are just like cast-offs, only it's their choice as opposed to it's their choice as opposed to um, um, not being their choice to leave. Social entrepreneurs are people that start businesses with specific social causes uh, that they want to support, uh, either um, for basically kind of like a nonprofit or maybe they just give a percentage of their profit to the social cause. Uh, I know you guys are all tired. I'm sick and tired of hearing of baby boomers, but there's still a bunch of them out there that are retiring. Many of them have accumulated some wealth and they're not ready to just sit in their chair and watch uh, Netflix all day long. So they start a business of some sort and, and they get involved in things. Uh, I do some networking with a guy that's exactly one of these. He, um, he had a great job in a corporation, made a lot of money, but he always had an interest in genealogy research. He now has a thriving business and he travels around the United States doing research because he likes to. He likes to go to courthouses and dig through the records. But um, he does genealogy research, charges a bunch of money for it, makes a bunch of money, and is having a great time. And it's his, like, I don't know if it's his second career or his 13th, but, you know, it's, it's like he's in retirement and he's enjoying things. That's, so there's entrepreneurial activities there. Now let's talk about small businesses and their you know, sort of their involvement in the United States. Small businesses make up 99.7%. This data is a little bit old. I'm going to tell you, there's about 30 million businesses in the United States now. The number's grown. This slide is a little old. But 90, um, small businesses do still represent the vast majority I'm going to peg that number at about 28 and a half million. Um, and when I say small businesses, uh, that's the U.S. Um, SBA definition of small businesses. 
which is a business that employs under 500 people. A business that employs 450 people is a huge business. So they, the U.S. government has kind of a weird definition of what a small business is. Um, small businesses employ 50% of the private sector workforce that create more jobs than any other sector of the economy. Um, and they're responsible for a tremendous amount of both new jobs as well as innovation within uh, the economy. Um, there are about 6 million businesses that have, uh, that have employees other than just the owner. In other words, out of all the businesses, out of the 28 million businesses that exist, 6 million, only 6 million of them have an employee other than the owner. Of them, 3.6 million have somewhere between one and four employees. Okay, the remainder, um, well, not the entire remainder, but the next group is uh, between five and nine employees. There's only about one million businesses that have between five and nine employees out of 20, out of 30 million businesses. There's, um, there's only about 633,000 businesses that have 10 to 20, 10 to 19 employees. There's only 526,000 that have between 20 and 99. There's only 90,000 businesses in the entire United States that have between 100 and 500 employees. Numbers getting much smaller. Now, as you go up the scale, there's um, only 18,500 businesses in the United States that are considered big businesses that have over 500 employees. Now, interestingly, when you compare that with the publicly traded companies, there's only a, around 8,000 publicly traded companies in the United States. Might be a little bit more, but basically about half of the businesses that have 500 employees or more, roughly half of them are publicly traded. Or let me rephrase that. The total number of publicly traded companies is about half the number of businesses that are over 500. There's a high correlation there, not 100%, but there's a high correlation. So what does that mean? Well, that means that there's about 22 million businesses that have no employees, just the owner. That would be what you would call a solopreneur, somebody that literally is the entire business. And there's a lot of them that are the entire business. Now, when you look at how the um, types of industries or businesses in the United States break it down, uh, about 54% are service businesses. And then if we look at the rest of them, we kind of look at uh, some interesting things. Okay, so the construction and the manufacturing business are the areas where, where you actually are making something. Manufacturing, just a little under 4%. Construction, almost 11.5%. So basically you have about 15, a little over 15% of the, um, of the economy, 15% 15 of the businesses, maybe 15 and a half percent are actually making something. Um, the rest of the businesses don't really make anything. I mean, think about it, wholesale, what is wholesale? They're moving stuff around that somebody else made. Retail, they're in the business of selling stuff. So wholesale is a service business that moves things. Retail is a service business that sells things. Finance, insurance, real estate, they're service businesses that manage information. I don't know what the other is. It's probably forestry and agriculture and stuff like that. Probably um, that's what that is. But if you really think of the services, people that are providing a service as opposed to making something, it's the vast majority of the economy. When you add the the 54% plus the 10% plus the 11% plus the 5%. When you add all that up, it comes to something in the neighborhood of 75% of the economy, 75-80% of the economy is really some sort of a service type of business. And so is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. Yeah, you know, you can make all kinds of arguments about it. Small businesses produce about 51% of the nation's GDP account for 40% of the actual revenue and create vastly more patents and intellectual property than big businesses do. Things like zippers and light bulbs and personal computers and all that kind of stuff were created by small businesses. Now let's think about what failure is. Actually, I think I have a new slide. I'm gonna see what comes next, yeah. 
Um, the slide I was just showing you is slightly outdated. This is a little bit more current slide. Slide. This covers the time frame from 1994 to 2016. So that's actually about a um, 12. I mean, a 22, 23 year time frame. So here's what this means. Um, businesses that have been in business for one year, 21.5% of them fail, which means the rest of them are still in business. So if we look at this data point right here, 21.5%, that means 21.5% of businesses fail within the first year. However, about 79.5% or 78.5% make it through the first year. 32.7%, let's just say 33% um, are actually out of business, um, fail within two years. So one third of all businesses fail within two years. Now, when you come out to five years, 51.6%, a little over 50%, just a little over 50% of all businesses fail within the first five years. When you go out to 10 years, uh, you kind of almost the reverse from the 10 years and the two years. 10 years, 66% of all businesses will have failed, which means that about one third of all businesses will make it uh, of 10 years or more. Now, there's all kinds of reasons uh, why these failures happen, but generally speaking, they can be boiled down into a number of sort of specific causes. Um, before we get into that, let's think about failure. Um, Literally, failure is a natural part of creating new things. When you create something new, uh, you don't know how it's going to work, and sometimes it doesn't. And the important thing about failing is to make sure that you learn lessons from the process of failing. Failure in and of itself is not a bad thing. It's certainly not something to be looked forward to. But if you learn important lessons and take those lessons and you apply them yet again to another attempt that becomes successful, then the failure was nothing more than a temporary setback. It wasn't a permanent mark on you. And so it's important to keep failure in perspective. And in fact, I want to call your attention to some interesting uh, failures. George Foreman filed for bankruptcy in 1983. I don't know how many of y'all have a Foreman grill. I've got one, uh, but the guy's worth well over $300 million. Foreman, George Foreman is an incredible marketing machine. The guy is so great. He smiles. He just looks like he just, he just like the guy. And so, I mean, he's good as a, as a corporate uh, huckster. Um, he made a lot of money after his bankruptcy. William Durant was the founder of General Motors. He filed for bankruptcy in 1936 and eventually went on to have in excess of $120 million. So let's just, let's just do this. Let's say that he filed for bankruptcy in 36. Let's just say that he passed away in, in, in 50, 1950. What is $120 million of $1950 worth today? Let's presume that money doubles about every 10 years. So how many doublings are there? Well, 1950 to 1960, 70, 80, 90, 2000, 2010, 2020. Now let's take the doubling. 120 goes to 240. I'm gonna round it to 500, 1 billion, 2 billion, 4 billion, 8 billion, $16 billion. William Durant was worth the equivalent of $16 billion back in 1950. Or thereabouts. I mean, that's a an incredible amount of wealth, from, you know, when you put it into present day dollars. Henry Ford went, went, went broke five times and still created the Ford Motor Company. Walt Disney was was fired by a newspaper editor that said he wasn't, he didn't have enough imagination and no good ideas. And the guy went on and created one of the most valuable companies on the planet. You know, so you can't let failure Oprah Winfrey was told that she would she wasn't gonna it, television wasn't gonna work for her because she didn't have a television personality. <laughs> yeah, that was by a, a television station in Atlanta when she was getting her foot in the door. So I'm telling you, you know, failure and rejection 
are part and parcel of being an entrepreneur. You just have to learn how to deal with it. So business starts and business closures. They actually tend to run fairly similar. Now, sometimes you'll have more starts and sometimes you'll have more closures. Obviously, during the, uh, the, the years of 2008 and 9, when you're entering the Great Recession, uh, you started to have more closures than, than starts, but there's a relatively equal number. There's always people out there that are uh, motivated and excited to get their piece of the American dream and start a business and get out there and just make things happen. Uh, it's, it's, always, it's always something that people want to do. Okay, now let's talk about uh, some interesting, um, some other interesting data points related to businesses. First, now we're going to be considering uh, something, basically the rate of growth and how investors look at the rate of growth. There is this concept of a lifestyle business. And a lifestyle business is any business that's been around for a few years that is growing at anything up to 20% per year. Now, if you had IBM or Apple or uh, you know, something like that growing at 20% per year, General Electric growing at 20% per year, everybody would be just blown away because it would sound like a growth stock. And that's a wonderful growth rate. But 20% a year is not a very good amount if you've been around for you know, three to five years. So if you have a business that's been around for three to five years and you're able to claim that you have an 18, 19, 20% growth rate, you're what an investor will consider to be a great, a potentially great lifestyle business. And that, whenever you hear that from an investor, what the investor is saying is, it's for your life, you can have a nice lifestyle, but I'm not putting any money in your business. And the reason is, is because investors are not typically interested in businesses that are only growing at 15, 18, 20% a year. Now, 20% is not bad. When you get into the 20 to 50% range, that's considered sort of mid-growth. And you're gonna to start to really pique the interest of investors. And it depends upon how far along you are and how big your numbers are. You know, if you've got a $100 million company and you're growing at 30 or 40% a year, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're actually a pretty interesting company. If you've got a $100,000 or $200,000 revenue company and you're growing at 30 to 50, 40, 50% a year, you're not very interesting to investors, okay? So, um, but, you, but they'll pay attention to you. They'll watch and see if that continues because after another couple of years, the numbers start to look pretty good. Investors are looking at businesses um, that have the opportunity to grow at in excess of 50% a year. And when, when you're in a business that's been around three to five years and you're consistently growing in excess of 50% a year, uh, investors are going to really take strong notice of your company and, and want to know and watch what you're doing. They may not be ready to invest, but they might be ready six months or a year or two years from now if you continue your growth patterns. Now, these data, these data points are from the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Business Workshop Initiative, which was going on a couple of years ago. It actually is almost identical to this class, except um, it was put on by Goldman, Goldman Sachs. Um, the information we cover in this class is almost identical to the information that was covered in the Goldman Sachs workshops. There are three, or excuse me, four fundamental growth curves. And um, they're not exclusive of each other. Uh, and there are, but generally speaking, when you look at the, uh, you know, a five or 10 year history of a company, they'll tend to fall, fall into one of these four growth curve uh, patterns. Uh, one is rapid, and we, you can see them, rapid, incremental, episodic, and plateau. So we're going to go through each one of them in sequence and chat just a little bit about them. The first one is the rapid growth curve. Now, when you're in the rapid growth curve um, business, you're basically in a business where everything is happening right. There's a lot of serendipity. You're in the right place at the right time with the right product at the right price, and you're mostly making right smart decisions. Uh, that actually was a growth curve that looked pretty similar to the FlashNet internet dial-up business that I had. And, um, you know, while we did some smart things, we also were just in the right place at the right time. 
So, you know, there's a little bit, there's almost always some element of serendipity that is related to a company that has a growth curve that looks like that. That doesn't mean that it's not a good thing. I mean, just because there's serendipity involved doesn't mean you can't ride that ride, that ride you know, and have a lot of fun, but um, it's awfully hard to engineer this kind of growth curve. Um, so that's the rapid growth curve. Now, the next is the incremental growth curve. And here you have significantly more sort of controlled stair-stepped growth. A great example of this would be Fuzzy's Tacos in the early days. Now, Fuzzy's has grown beyond this. Fuzzy's has a different kind of growth curve now. But in the beginning, when Fuzzy's Tacos was a single taco place on Westbury Street near TCU, in, in about 1972 or three when they, I think it was about then, when they opened that store. Now I moved to the DFW area in 1974 and Fuzzy's was already here because I ate there. But there was only one Fuzzy's Taco. Now they have 30 or 40 of them around North Texas. But when there was only one Fuzzy's Taco, it was a new concept and they did very well. They would have people lined up outside the door down the street um, a lot of days during lunch and uh, early dinner and a lot of them were students, but it didn't matter. They would have people lined up. There are only so many tacos you can make during an hour um, at a taco joint. You just simply have a limit to how many people you can get through, how, many, how much your kitchen can do. So once you max out the revenue for that location, if you own Fuzzy's Tacos, the only way for you to make more money is to open a second location. So that's the concept behind the stair step. You have to add facilities to be able to increase revenue. Now, when you add two or three or four or five after a period of time and you step back in time, that curve looks less stair-stepped and more gradual, and it might end up looking steep or it might end up looking like something else, but um, that is an incremental uh, growth curve, and if you look closely enough at an incremental growth curve and ask the right questions, you can understand a lot about the nature of the business. Another is the episodic growth curve. Now, the episodic growth curve is best um, characterized by the idea that you have a small number of very valuable clients, and um, this growth curve indicates the loss and regaining of clients. So let me give you an example. Let's say you're in some sort of a consulting business, and you have a a partner and between you and your partner and a staff of five people, uh, you do $100,000 a month. Now that's a pretty good little consulting business. That's 1.2 million a year. And so you have 10 clients, each generating $10,000 a month and you and your partner are taking home 30 grand a month each. So that's 60, you have another 40 to spend across your business facilities and paying your five employees. So, you have $10,000 a month, 10 clients, you lose a client. Let's see, I'm gonna pull my, my little finger down. Now you have $90,000 a month coming in. Well, you and your partner don't really have to take much of a hit on your income, if any, you just have to tighten the belts a little bit. You lose another one, now you're down to $80,000 a month. Well, you start to have some significant choices. Are you going to cut your um, employees or are you gonna cut your personal pay? Well, you're probably gonna cut both, your employees and your personal pay. You lose one more and you're down to just 70,000 a month coming in, now you're starting to get nervous, you're cutting more staff and you're cutting your pay. The point is, when you only have a small number of clients and each one represents a big portion of your business, the loss of a client can be uh, traumatic. The loss of two or three clients can be extremely traumatic. And so when you see a, a very episodic growth curve that's typically indicative of a business that has a relatively small number of clients, each of which make a significant contribution to both revenue and the bottom line. And so in these kinds of businesses, you'll see a lot of peaks and valleys um, uh, as you look at a historical um, revenue uh, projection or, or chart. Then you have the plateau growth curve which is typically indicative of a more mature company. Now, if you take any company that has been around for a long time, that's gotten large, and you step back far enough in time and you look at a big enough horizon, 
almost all of their charts will, will tend to look like this because there's a limit to how fast a company can continue to grow its revenues. Even Apple is seeing a tailing off on its revenues. All companies reach a point in time where they simply cannot continue to grow at the same accelerated or high rate of growth because there's just not enough critical mass on the planet to do so. Otherwise, a company like Apple, if they continued its growth rate of five to 10 years ago, it would end up absorbing every company on the planet. You just simply can't continue to grow. However, when a company does reach a plateau, there are some limited choices for how you reinvigorate and accelerate the growth of the company. And those choices basically boil down to uh, you um, bring in new management and or you bring in new products or new revenue streams. Now, often, one of the reasons a company reaches a plateau point is because existing management is entrenched in their um, traditional way of thinking and they're not willing and or able to come up with innovative new business models and or profit products to be able to uh, in continue to grow the revenue of the company at a significant rate. So what will often happen is you'll see the sale off, the selling of div selling of divisions like with General Electric, or you'll see the entry into new markets. Now, uh, you currently see Apple trying to engage and, and, and get into new service oriented markets like Apple News and Apple TV and stuff like that, where they're creating content and curating content uh, to try to get in on the streaming uh, business wave uh, or uh, yeah, ride, ride that wave. Um, Apple's probably not going to be able to come up with a new product as, as, as important to the revenue stream as um, the iPhone was because there's just probably not that many new products out there. That's kind of the current thinking. So almost all companies reach a point where they simply cannot continue to grow and they start to plateau. And that's usually when you'll see the board of directors begin to come in and start changing management teams so they can get some fresh thoughts in and break away from the traditional thinking that uh, usually gets ingrained into senior management teams. All right, how do you avoid the pitfalls of failure? Well, uh, th this is not a whole lot of rocket science right here. Uh, there's really just a few things that are important for you to know and be sure to do. First, don't get into a business that you don't know and understand. Make sure that you are an expert in the business that you get involved in. If you get involved in a business where you are not an expert, then you're probably going to, you know, <laughs> you're probably going to get an education and that is usually a pretty expensive education. So be sure that you know your business in depth before you go off and start a business. Now, this next one, develop a solid business plan. That would seem to be just an obvious thing to do, but here's the thing. About 50% of businesses that are started are started without a business plan. A business plan is such a fundamentally powerful tool for you to use to help ensure success that, that you just really shouldn't start a business without one. And hopefully you'll come away from this class understanding and realizing the importance and better yet, understanding and realizing the fundamentals of how to create a good business plan. The next is managing your financial resources. You hear a lot about startup companies in Silicon Valley buying unlimited, you know, um, uh, Skittles or, you know, they have lunch rooms, they have playrooms, they have basketball courts. I mean, they have all these toys. What you don't really hear about is that uh, the, a lot of the times the reason they provide that stuff is because they expect you to work 60 to 80 hours a week. So they don't mind if you take a few hours out during the middle of the week to decompress. But the reality is, is um, you have to be very careful about spending your money because money is an incredibly precious commodity. It literally is the lifeblood of the business. And so having, um, there really are sort of two or three major questions that you have to know the answer to when you start a business. Number one is how much capital do you need to get the business to the point where it'll generate enough capital to sustain itself? And when it does generate enough capital to sustain itself, will it in fact generate enough cash flow capital 
to grow at a rate that makes it worth growing and getting involved in the business. So in other words, it's all about money. Do you have enough to start the business and will it generate enough money to sustain itself? And even more importantly, will it generate enough money to make it worth all the effort that it took to get to that end zone? So managing your financial resources is a critical component. And to do that, you have to both use and understand your monthly financial statements. I had a client um, hire me a few years ago to help them with um, some general marketing and financial sort of issues they were having. This was a business that was doing about $1.2, $1.3 million a year. And so that's a little over $100,000 a month. So I came and sat in on a board meeting. And these are non-professional board people. They're not business people, though they're not lacking in business knowledge. I sat in on my first board meeting and almost the first question I asked was, okay, can you show me your last three years worth of monthly income statements on a spreadsheet? And they just kind of looked at each other with grins and a little bit of embarrassment and said, we don't have it. All they had was annual tax returns. Well, the first thing we had to do in that business was generate monthly financial statements for the last three years so I could look and see, because you can't really tell what's going on in the business if you don't have data. You have to have data. And there's nothing more fundamental to, the, you know, to knowing how your business is doing than watching your monthly financial information. And then the last thing is learn to manage people effectively. Um, actually, not the last thing. Um, the last thing was next. Learn to manage your people effectively. So I am going to um, suggest that the best managers are managers with kids. Um, so here's why I say that. I can't tell you how many times I've had a conversation with a staff person that basically goes this way. Set them down on the other side of the table and say, okay, um, are you looking at me? Are you paying attention? Because I have something important I have to tell you. I want your undivided attention. Look me in the eye. I need you to do this. A, B, C, X, Y, Z, one, two, three, do as I say. Um, okay, now there might be some collaborative thinking going along with that, but generally I'm not talking about a senior vice president. I'm talking about somebody that's sort of a frontline worker, the kind of person that should be on the phone or on the computer, but they're on their cell phone because they can't keep their eyes off their cell phone while, while they're at work, right? So that's the kind of person we're talking about. So when you're talking with somebody like that, when you have a task for them, you have to basically say, okay, I want your attention for just a moment. Okay, pay attention. Look me in the eye. Here's what I want you to do. Now repeat back to me what it is I wanted you, what I said. I want to hear you say it. Hey, repeat it back. Okay, great. We understand each other. Now, here's when I need to have this done by. And you tell them when it needs to be done. Do you understand that? When do I need it done? They repeat back to you when it needs to be done. Okay, now, if it's not done, it's, other people are waiting on you to finish that task. So if it's not done by next Tuesday at noon, um, you know, you're delaying a whole bunch of people. It's costing a bunch of money. There's going to be a consequence. So let's agree to the consequence beforehand so that we're in agreement that the what the consequence will be. So but here's the consequence. The consequence will be you're going to be taken off the job and basically be told to go out and clean the chicken coop or whatever. Okay, do we understand each other? Okay, now we understand. Good, go do it. Now, that's like a conversation with a kid. And I've been a little bit farcical about how I've tried to explain it. But the reality is, is a little bit less dramatic and a little bit more soft, you have to have those conversations with staff people because, you know, you're, especially your mid to low level staff people, they're not professionals that are self motivators and they're just like kids. And so I usually tell my students that if you want to really be a good manager, go have a bunch of kids. That's probably the best training I can recommend to you. Okay, that was supposed to be at least partly funny. I have no sense of whether you guys got a chuckle out of that or not, but I'll presume you're all rolling in the floor. Um, Whitney has entered the room. Welcome back, Whitney. All right, so um, the next thing, and um, actually important, maybe the most important thing, 
is that you have to be able to set your business apart from all your competitors. We're going to talk a lot about this, not today, not tomorrow, but soon, called the concept of competitive advantage. Competitive advantage is fundamentally why somebody would come to you instead of a competitor and what keeps that competitor from getting the same advantage over you. So in other words, a competitive advantage is something that you do that they can't do and it attracts a customer, right? So if you don't have that, if you don't have a competitive advantage, I'm sorry, I don't care how good you are, you probably don't have a business. So you have to have a competitive advantage in the market. All right, so I don't know, that might be our last slide. Oh, maintain a positive attitude. You know, business is tough. You're inevitably going to have periods of time when you are struggling, when things are difficult. And so when those times come, it's important for you to have a positive attitude. It, as soon as you believe that the business is not going to make it, that's the moment, that's the moment in time when the business is going to fail. You have to have an undeniable, absolute certainty that you're going to succeed. Otherwise, you're not. And the only way you can have that is if that comes inside of you because you have confidence in your vision, your passion drives your vision, you know you're meant to do this, you know you're going to succeed, and you're willing to put in the hard work to make it happen. That positive attitude infuses the entire business. Everybody in that business is drawn to and drives and, and feeds off of your passion and your positivity, and it's up to you to maintain it at all times. So in conclusion, entrepreneurs are an important part of our free enterprise system. Have a, they, come, they are a diverse, talented group of people. With a, they completely represent a cross-section of society. And they're able to um, do great things because of their drive and motivation. So we have 11 minutes left, and I'm going to go ahead and Stop for a moment, check in, see what kind of questions. Um, laugh out loud, don't do it. Um, ha, ha, ha. I was an employee at American until June of 19th. Okay, I'm not sure what y'all are laughing at, but um, maybe me. Ha, ha, I did get a laugh, yay. Okay, I live for laughs. Okay, um, we're going to go ahead and do a little bit of the next lecture, just because I want to make sure we don't get behind. And so the next lecture is this one. So we're jumping into chapter three, creativity and innovation. And let's go over here. All right. You know what, I'm just going to stop here. I am going to call this an end because I want to, I want to, I'm just going to call it an end for the night. All right, does anybody have any questions um, that I can answer at this point? Anybody have any comments? Let's see if I can, can I unmute all? Allow participants to unmute yourself. I think I've now allowed everybody to unmute themselves. Anybody have any questions? Everybody just ready to go get your Labor Day weekend on? Um, Omar, you get extra points for the ha 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 and, and the LOL. All right. Um, I'm kidding. Omar doesn't get any extra points. Um, okay, so. Have a happy Labor Day. I'll see you on Tuesday uh, at 7 o'clock. Thank you. Bye.